So thanks again for the invitation. Um, I will talk about some of the work we've been doing over the last, um, well, probably eight, nine years um, on developing computational methods to link phenotypic differences between species to um, differences in their genomes. And uh, so um, probably you have a diverse audience. So um, the talk is quite simplified. Um, I would like to use some, uh, um, so I would like to give you an overview of the methods we've developed and how they work on a, on a simple level, um, and also give you, in a way, um, ideas of uh, what things we discovered um, in terms of biology and genomic changes here. And of course, um, feel free to ask any questions in, in between. So to me, one of the most fascinating aspects of biology is this um, fantastic phenotypic diversity that uh, has evolved. For example, bats are able to, um, to navigate and hunt in complete darkness. The sperm whale can die for more than one hour. Um, these guys can hover in the same spot for an extended period of time. We have mammals with body armor, and we have mammals that in a way lost um, functional eyes and other species that lost limbs. And I think this diversity is potentially what Charles Darwin meant when he wrote about endless forms, most beautiful and most wonderful, um, at the very end of uh, the origin of species. So in the genomic era, all the uh, species shown here, and of course many others have sequenced genomes, and because many of the traits have a strong genetic basis, this allows us now to address a a challenging but fundamentally important question. What is the genomic basis that underlies these uh, phenotypic differences and therefore this phenotypic diversity? And this question is the main question that my, um, um, in a way, unites the, the work we are doing in the lab. So conceptually, it makes sense to think of different types of genomic changes that can affect molecular function and therefore may contribute to phenotypic differences. So you could imagine that uh, um, changes in regulatory elements um, lead to differences in the expression pattern of a gene or novel expression pattern. Um, changes in the protein coding sequence can affect the function of the protein. Um, novel genes can arise by duplication or de novo. Ancestral genes can get lost in evolution, and of course, there are many other types of uh, um, changes possible. So we, um, over the last years, worked on these four types of changes shown here. Um, but for this talk, I will only focus on uh, um, discussing these two types of changes. And in particular, in the first part of the talk, I will um, talk about differences in the gene regulatory elements and uh, how this is associated with losing functional eyes and limbs. And in the second part, I will show you or try to show you that sometimes losing genes can be um, an advantage. And then I will conclude with an outlook. So the first part is work that uh, several postdocs in my lab, Giuliano Rossito, Katrin Samait, and Janice Parra worked on, and also um, Bjorn Langer, who was a PhD student at the time and who defended his thesis last year. So to link phenotypic differences and uh, genomic differences, we developed, um, as actually as, as a postdoc, um, we developed this so-called forward genomics framework. And this general approach focuses on phenotypes that were present in the ancestor and then got changed or lost in independent um, lineages. And this approach conducts a genome-wide screen, so all the lines here in a way are represented the, or represent the entire genome. And the method focuses on those regions in the genomes that are overall conserved between these species. And we try to find these regions that are more diverged or sometimes even completely lost in those species that have changed or lost this particular phenotype. So we try to find, in a way, a match or an association between a phenotypic um, difference pattern and the genomic um, di di divergence pattern here. And I'd like to show you, um, give you a few more details of how we actually find such associations. <clears throat> 
So here you have a phylogenetic tree of the species of interest. And if we now focus on, a, on one of these conserved regions, so this is typically in the order of a few hundred base pairs, then we can use the sequences at the tips. So this is what, uh, in a way, we, have, we, we know to computationally reconstruct these ancestral states, which are the internal nodes in this, um, in this phylogenetic tree here. And this allows us then to focus um, at the start and end of each of those branches and measure how much of the sequence of this element is still conserved. So here's an illustration of that. If this is the sequence at the start of the branch and this is the sequence at the end, we can simply count the number of identical bases after aligning these sequences. In this case, 11 out of 15 bases are identical. So we would say that 73% of that sequence was conserved along that particular branch. And then we can um, classify the branches in the tree into two groups, into those in green, along which the trait was preserved, and along those in, in, in red, along which the, the trait was most likely lost. So now we have um, two groups of branches. And for each branch, we have a... Um, a sequence conservation value. And what's important is that the species at the tips, they are related, and therefore their sequences are not independent. So we, this is why we don't compare, um, for example, directly the sequence of those two species together, um, because they share, in a way, a common evolutionary history. But if we dissolve the phylogenetic tree into its branches, then each branch represents independent evolution, and therefore, these values shown here, they are independent data points. And then we can use um, something like Pearson correlation to ask whether the trade loss branches are associated um, with lower um, conservation values, meaning more divergence, compared to the trade preserving branches. Um, and so then you can ask whether you have a significant p-value for um, a positive Pearson correlation. And if so, we would say that there's a significant association between this phenotypic pattern and the divergence pattern in that particular genomic region. And then, of course, we can uh, march over the entire genome, look at thousands of conserved um, regions, and then you would get this kind of macroevolutionary Manhattan plot, right? Um, very fitting in this city here, um, which in a way shows the position of each of those um, regions along the, the genome, all the chromosomes here, and the, the lo uh, minus log p-values in the y-axis. So let's get into a specific example to see how this um, works. So one phenotype um, that we were very interested in is the degeneration of eyes in the subterranean mammals. Question, please. Can I ask a question regarding the, the previous plot? Sure. So when you have these kind of like millions of statistical tests, can you can you just do individual or you have to do any of this multi-hypothesis testing? Yeah, yeah, yeah. We, should, we would, in a way, correct for some multiple testing. Yeah. And so um, this is exactly the individual or that's, that's already corrected? Um, I think this is the, the raw p-value for the trait vitamin C synthesis, which is something that actually we have lost. We cannot synthesize um, vitamin C ourselves. And certain types of bats and the guinea pig also has lost it. And the... This is the raw p-value here, but what you can see is that there is something that stands out in this locus here, and this is actually the, the, the exons of the gene that synthesizes vitamin C. So then um, um, I, I, I can't tell you off the top of my head, this is pretty old data in a way, um, where the FDR significance threshold line would, would be, but you could imagine it, it's somewhere here, and then you would need to inspect those, those hits. A very, very good question. Okay. So if you look at this, um, this, this tree of mammals, you see that there are four independent lineages that have evolved a subterranean lifestyle. And this is always associated with um, tiny eyes um, that are highly degenerated. And these two species, that actually what they do is they dig tunnels with their forehead. They have buried their rudimentary eyes beneath skin, probably to protect whatever was left. So... We were interested in using this forward genomics framework to investigate what are the genomic changes associated with eye degeneration. 
And the method considers, um, clicking too fast here. The method considers um, all conserved regions in the genome and they largely fall into two classes. And the first class are exons of coding genes. And here we find significant sequence divergence in these subterranean species in exons that belong to a total of 208 genes. And what is interesting is that those 208 genes are highly enriched for I-related genes. You can see this here as a, um, um, the kind of the minus log, P, uh, this, this um, case, the adjusted, so the FDR is shown in the y-axis. And then we see enrichments for something like Go terms, visual perception, um, lens development, structural lens components, which are many of those crystalline genes. We also find enrichments for genes that give abnormal eye phenotypes if you knock out the gene in a mouse and genes that are associated with human eye diseases like uh, cataracts, which means getting a cloudy lens. The um, other part of these conserved genomic regions are the so-called conserved non-exonic elements that I will abbreviate with CNEs. And these CNEs often overlap cis regulatory elements that determine the or control the expression patterns of genes. And here, out of a large set of uh, 350,000 of these CNEs, we found significant sequence divergence in these subterranean uh, mammals here in about 9,300 of them. So then, of course, the question is what is special about these diverged CNEs? And that question is not as easy to answer because in contrast to the genes where we often know what genes are doing, we don't know much about what these CNEs are doing. So therefore we've been using two statistical approaches to investigate what these CNEs are enriched in. And the first approach assumes that these CNEs would regulate um, one or potentially both genes on either side of the CNE. And then we can um, ask whether these associated genes themselves are enriched in certain functions. And if we do this, we find that the CNEs diverged in these subterranean mammals are significantly associated with genes that give abnormal eye and in particular lens phenotypes if you knock them out in a mouse. And you can see this here, um, those are all the, the bars in orange. And for example, you can see here that out of 42 genes that give an abnormal lens fiber morphology in a mouse knockout, more than half of these genes um, are associated with such uh, diverged CNEs. A more direct way to assess what these diverged CNEs are doing is to use functional genomics and determine the genomic regions that overlap I regulatory elements. Um, and here you would like to use um, a species that has functional eyes, right? So you would like to know what happens to normal eye development and function. And then we can um, assess whether the diverged CNEs overlap these eye regulatory elements more often than the, um, the non-diverged CNEs, right? So this would be a simple Fisher's exact test. And to ask if such a putative enrichment is specific to eye regulatory elements, we can repeat the same exercise using functional genomics data from other tissues. So we decided to um, use a TACSEQ, which is a very um, simple but powerful method to profile open chromatin, so regions of the genome which are not densely bound or packed around nucleosomes. And the idea is that um, such open chromatin regions, that this is a hallmark of regulatory activity in the respective tissue. And we um, used mouse um, as a species where we could extract certain tissues from and applied a taxi to whole eye tissue at embryonic day 11 and a half, um, separating lens and retina tissue at three days later. And we also um, did a taxi on limb and brain for, for comparison. And we found that the diverged CNEs are significantly enriched in um, our eye taxi data sets. And this we could confirm looking at um, publicly available data sets um, for, um, for adult um, mouse eye tissues like 
um, transcription factor chip seek data in the retina, um, or this is another method to obtain open chromatin peaks in the retina, um, and, and this is another chip seek data set here. And in contrast, if you look at non-eye tissues, such as uh, skeletal tissue um, or midbrain or limb, then we don't find any preferential enrichment. So from this, we can conclude that um, there are in the order of a few hundred conserved non-coding regions that are diverged in these subterranean mammals here, um, and that are located near genes required for normal eye development and function, and that overlap eye regulatory elements. And together with the results for, for genes, this tells us that likely divergence in both genes and in regulatory elements contributes to eye degeneration in, in these creatures here. A second trait that I find incredibly fascinating, I would argue this is probably one of the most radical body plan transformation that we see among vertebrates, is the loss of limbs in the evolution of snakes. Question. Just if we make the analogy with like DNA as reading code, so it means like it's all these species rather like comment out code rather than deleting it when something is not really needed anymore? I, this is a good question. Um, kind of. So they are, they are partially, they're also deleting um, things. Um, and I will, um, so there are, bit, there are complete deletion of these CNEs. There are also complete deletions of parts of genes or entire genes. But overall, this happens rarely, in, um, at least in mammals, likely because the, this, the genome size of, uh, of mammals is not tightly regulated. So if you have, um, and we know that, for example, in our genome, there are large portions of the genome are likely, they do not have any function, yet there's no selection pressure to reduce them. Um, so it is more like you can imagine of, of code where um, you actually accumulate typos, so it's no longer proper syntax. But when the program is executed, um, in a way, the, the computer would jump over segments of the code that correspond to genes or regulatory elements. Um, so they wouldn't disturb the execution of the remaining code. So that's kind of maybe the analogy there. Is there any possibility to like further an evolution that reuse it or that code is probably um, lost? That is possible. That is possible that these um, um, ele regulatory elements or genes that originally served an eye-related function um, then get turned into something else, right? Because now there's no selection to maintain an eye-related function anymore. That's possible for the, um, and this probably happens to some extent, I would imagine, because evolution is always very creative. And in my experience, anything you can imagine, there are examples out there. <laughs> Um, I don't know of any particular example because for this we would have to use experiment to really um, investigate these, these things. But for the most part, I would argue that these CNEs or those genes are evolving neutrally, meaning at some point they will get um, deleted or they will mutate beyond our ability to still recognize the remnants. Okay, loss of limbs. Um, as a second trait we looked at, so again, the question is which genomic changes are associated with losing limbs? And I'll make a long story short, in a way we, um, we, we used a genome alignment to obtain a set of um, 164,000 of these CNEs that are now conserved across amniotes, so mammals, birds, reptiles, and we found significant sequence divergence in the snakes in 5,400 of them. And for those, we could show that these diverged CNEs are preferentially located near limb-related genes. And using a taxi, we could show that they also overlap limb regulatory elements that are active during normal limb development in um, a lizard that has um, proper limbs, right? And so this also shows us that similar to eye degeneration in these mammals, um, there is widespread sequence divergence now in limb regulatory elements in snakes. And I would like to not only show you, well, question first. Yeah, so um, what was limb loss 
did it happen in one common ancestor? So my question is, you have many extant yep. species, but if there's one event, when you think about your power to differentiate, is it correct to think of the number of extant species yep. or is the it? number of ancestral branch points? It's the um, very good question. I was hoping in a way to glance over this um, this this. Um, this aspect here. So um, snakes is um, one lineage and they have lost limbs only once, about um, definitely more than 200 million years ago based on fossil evidence. Um, so in contrast to um, eye degeneration in those subterranean mammals happened at least four times independently. So um, we're not, we're using in a way as a variant of this forward genomics method that still reconstructs ancestral states but then in a way simply uses a Z-score measure to ask that the, which of those CNEs are significantly more diverged in, in the snakes. And we can do simulations um, and some other statistical measures to in a way show that this set here is, um, I think the most conservative is still an FDR of less than 5%. Yeah, but um, in general, you would like to have independent changes um, of your trade of interest, because we know based on simulation, this increases power to detect the right regions. And we have projects in the work where we um, sequenced other reptiles, independent lineages that also have um, reduced or absent limbs. And the way then we are we're in the process of running forward genomics and uh, um, analyzing this, this kind of data. Actually, limb loss. Um, despite the fact that it's a very radical transition, happens in reptiles probably 30 times independently or more. Right, so that's something to think about. There's lots of stuff to study, definitely. Um, okay, I would like to not give you kind of statistics, but also in a way give you a feeling of how the data looks like. So this is looking into um, a certain region of the genome, and these are these attack seek signal tracks. So you see here that there's elevated signal in the four replicates of limb tissue. So this is a limb regulatory element. We don't get any open chromatin in brain or liver. And I picked this particular example because um, it overlaps a CNE, which is located here, that in mouse is known to regulate the GLEE3 transcription factor. And this is a key gene that is required for proper limb development. And you can see here in the sequence alignment that in these two snakes, there are, um, well, there are nucleotide changes and also larger deletions that remove parts of this regulatory element. So then a very important question is, is the, the sequence divergence that we have been measuring so far, is that a signature of functional decay? Or is it like, um, in an analogy, typically I use a different analogy, but um, here, an analogy to computer code, if you um, add spaces to your comment lines, the code obviously wouldn't be affected. Yet, if you would diff um, your two source code files, probably a bunch of lines would show up as having differences, right? So if the sequence divergence is a sign of functional decay, then you would expect that um, mutations we see here, in, for example, in these snakes, that they destroy binding sites for important transcription factors, as it is shown here in these, um, to, in, in these for, for this particular regulatory element. And this is not only, of course, it's a beautiful picture and kind of a poster child, but um, we could actually show systematically that the CNEs diverged in the subterranean mammals have lost on a massive scale binding sites for eye transcription factors, and that the snake diverged CNEs have been losing many limb transcription factor binding sites. And this um, observation in a way led to the idea that we can probably better capture functional divergence if we're not measuring sequence divergence, so simply counting the number of nucleotides that differ, but we should look at the difference at the binding site level. And here are um, two toy examples motivating that. So if you compare um, the sequence of a, you know, an ancestral sequence and the sequence of a species, then in this case, we only see two mutations. So at the sequence level, not much has happened. But at the binding site level, those two mutations destroy two potentially important binding sites. So detecting such a regulatory element would increase sensitivity. 
The other example here, we have um, much more sequence changes. Um, but if we look at the binding site level, then these sequence changes happen maybe outside of binding sites, um, or they flip a base such that the transcription factor can still bind because at this position, it um, is okay with having either an A or a T. And in this case, we actually destroy this binding site here, but other changes downstream create an equivalent um, binding sites close by. So likely, um, from a functional point of view, not much has happened here, despite the fact we have much more sequence changes. So not detecting such a case would increase specificity. And long story short, we developed a method that we call um, regulatory element forward genomics, or reforge, that uses the same kind of framework of reconstructing ancestral um, states and measuring differences along every branch. But now we're not measuring sequence conservation, but we're measuring how well are binding sites of relevant transcription factors preserved. And um, we applied this set or this, this method to, to the same set of 350,000 CNEs we've been using before. And all we used was um, the, the binding motifs. So those are those, um, those logos that you can see here. They describe which binding sites are preferred by a particular transcription factor. So if we take the motifs of 28 known I-related transcription factors and use this regulatory element forward genomics method, we find um, significant binding site divergence in 2,700 of them. So this is fewer CNEs compared to more than 9,000 CNEs we had before. So likely we are more specific. We can show that this smaller set is actually more enriched in I regulatory elements. And what's interesting is we found um, many additional hits near very important genes for eye development, um, genes associated with um, human eye diseases, where we couldn't find any significant sequence divergence before. So this is an indication that, in fact, we do have um, you know, increased sequence, sens um, we have in increased sensitivity. Okay, to sum up the first part, um, I showed you methods that detect um, sequence, but also transcription factor binding site divergence in um, putative regulatory elements. And we found um, a number of hundreds of um, such elements with in, um, increased sequence and binding site divergence that likely contributed to eye degeneration in these subterranean mammals and the process of uh, limb loss in snakes. And I would argue by looking at two different groups of species and two different types of traits, um, so seeing the same picture on the way twice argues that the, the widespread divergence of these regulatory elements um, is likely a hallmark of losing complex traits where you need many regulatory elements and many genes to properly develop them. Okay, in the second part, I would like to now talk specifically about um, losing genes and some uh, um, very, to me, very exciting aspects that we, we discovered. And this is the work of uh, Virak Sharma, Nicola Hecker, and Giuliano Rossito. So here's the motivation for this project. This forward genomics framework that measures um, sequence divergence, um, question, yes? There are no limbless mammals. Um, there are um, manatees and dolphins. They have lost their legs, but they still have, um, in a way, flippers. And we know that um, the regulatory elements that determine limb development are, for the most part, they are work on both the forelimb and the hind limbs. So, but it's an interesting trait, actually, and, and we and others are also working on what are the um, genomic changes that led to leg loss in those um, aquatic lineages. But that appears to be a very tricky question. In amphibians, we haven't looked for the main reason that those genomes are not yet available. Um, amphibian genomes are very large, 
um, and therefore difficult to sequence and assemble. Um, and so with vertebrate genome projects and other um, large scale efforts to in a way, you know, sequence life or get there at the end, um, we will get these genomes, but right now they have not yet been, been sequenced. Yeah. Good question. Um, okay, so this, this forward genomics method just measures sequence divergence, right? And it does, um, the nice thing is it gives you an unbiased way to look at the genome because if this is a gene and this is a regulatory element, we would treat it in exactly the same way, right? The downside, of course, is that we're ignoring any biological knowledge we actually have about the different types of genomic elements. And I showed you before that we can do better in capturing functional divergence and loss for regulatory elements if we look at transcription factor binding site differences. And similar to that, if we think of gene loss, um, we know which types of mutations destroy a gene. So here we compare the sequence, um, this is just a sketch, right? Um, the sequence of a coding exon across two species or an ancestor in a species. And then of course, um, the entire region can get deleted, right? That's an obvious mutation, but also such smaller deletions of uh, one or two bases. Um, so that would shift the protein's reading frame or mutations that destroy the conserved splice site dinucleotides. And of course, um, base changes that create in-frame stop codons. All these mutations are an indication that the gene no longer encodes a functional protein and therefore is lost. So detecting these kinds of mutations appears to be a straightforward problem, I would say. Um, at least that's what we thought when we started doing that project. After all, with such an alignment, we can all do this by hand, right? And it doesn't require a lot of code to just screen this alignment and detect whether you have stop codons and frame shifts. But um, in a way to run forward genomics, um, we needed to identify such gene inactivating mutations across the entire genome, meaning across literally all genes. Um, we had to do so across many, many species and of course, we have to achieve a very high accuracy because um, any kind of manual intervention, manual curation is no longer an option, right? And then it turns out to, um, that finding such mutations at very high accuracy is actually a formidable challenge because there are a number of um, issues related to um, the fact that those genome assemblies are not perfect, that the alignments we're using are not perfect, and the fact that um, even conserved genes can change in their structure in, in evolution without being lost. Um, I'll just illustrate two of these um, probably more prevalent issues. So here you have a sequence alignment and you see that um, this G to C mutation in the cow clearly destroys this splice site. So this indicates gene loss. But it turns out that in the cow, the splice site has just shifted nine bases upstream, meaning this exon in the cow is just nine bases or three amino acids longer, right? So this is no telling us the gene is not lost. In this case, we have a, um, a very nice sequence alignment that has a four base insertion in the cow. Um, again, it's a frame shift, so indicating gene loss. But you can find, um, an alternative alignment, and this is not to be confused with alternative facts, so this really exists, um, where this, this four base insertion is now shifted in the intron. And both of these alignments have the same sequence identity. And with this alignment, we would of course clearly say there is no indication for gene loss, that gene is conserved. So we developed um, a computational pipeline that tries to address all these issues shown here as best as possible. And this actually took us several years to develop. And if we test this pipeline on a very large set of truly conserved genes, then we obtain a specificity of 99.7% or higher. That means this pipeline makes very few mistakes of calling a conserved gene as lost. And this very high accuracy enabled us to then systematically determine gene losses in the genomes of um, 
these 62 different placental mammals shown here. Um, and then, of course, with this very rich data set, you can ask um, and address a number of interesting questions. Um, the question I would, uh, that I found most exciting um, is which genes are lost in species that exhibit um, obvious, very prominent phenotypic adaptations. And if we take a step back and think of how, how an adaptive trait, so a trait that enhances fitness, enhances survival, how such a trait evolves, then we would expect that it is typically maybe changes in, in gene expression um, or optimizing protein function um, or potentially genomic novelty, novel genes, right? So those are the types of changes that likely contribute to adaptation. Um, but we found evidence that sometimes losing ancestral genes can also contribute to adaptive traits. And um, while this is um, kind of well established in, in microbes where, or bacteria where people can do experimental evolutions, they can really track evolution over time in a dish, um, in mammals there were very few examples of those. And when gene loss can be beneficial, I would argue this is definitely um, less intuitive. After all, it means that breaking an existing genetic component is somehow a good idea. Okay, and to understand um, when gene loss can be an advantage, um, I would like to contrast two main principles that can explain why a certain gene is lost. So the principles are use it or lose it, and less is more. And I will explain those principles using two genes that we discovered are exclusively lost in the sperm whale. The first gene is BCO1. And this encodes an enzyme that cleaves beta carotene into vitamin A. So losing this enzyme tells us that the sperm whale has lost the ability to synthesize vitamin A. And that was very unexpected because it was known that the internal organs of that creature are very rich in vitamin A. So where is this vitamin A coming from? Well, we think it's coming from the diet because sperm whales feed predominantly on these large squid. And if you dig into literature from the 1950s, um, you can find out that these squid provide very little beta carotene, so very little substrate, but they contain a lot of vitamin A. And this indicates that um, the sperm whale likely had no use for this BCO1 gene anymore after it evolved this very um, specific diet because um, there was no substrate around and there was no necessary to keep, was no need to keep the gene because um, the diet provided the sperm whale with enough of the, the product, right? So we think um, this gene was lost because the sperm whale was no longer using it. The second gene, um, and, and this in a way makes the contrast, is called AMPD3. And this gene is um, expressed in red blood cells. And that was interesting to us um, because compared to other whales and dolphins, the sperm whale is an exceptional diver. The sperm whale can dive for more than one hour to depths of several kilometers deep. Um, and so interesting is that mouse experiments have um, revealed what happens if you lose, if you knock out this, this gene. This gene encodes an enzyme, and if you knock it out, then the ATP levels in erythrocytes are elevated. And ATP is not only a source of cellular energy, it is also an allosteric effector that stabilizes hemo the hemoglobin form that is not bound to oxygen. And this, in turn, um, then fa facilitates oxygen release in the capillaries. So in other words, um, if you lose AMPD3, you enhance oxygen transport from the lung into the tissue. And this is likely um, an advantage for a long diving species. So this is a case where less genes, in this case, is more for that particular um, adaptation. Yep. 
that is a good question. Um, we uh, um, <clears throat> we don't know, um, but the gene is highly conserved in all other sixty something um, mammals um, what we were looked at. So there must so in in evolutionary terms there is a reason to preserve the gene, and I think um, these gene losses which may belong to the less is more category, they are beneficial to lose under certain circumstances um, or certain environmental condition, but they are um, definitely required um, for, for other mammals. And I'll give you one other example I won't talk about. Um, we found recently that uh, in all whales and dolphins, they have lost a particular DNA repair enzyme. And this is the enzyme, there are several genes doing that job, um, in a way repairing DNA damage caused by oxidative stress, so, so um, reactive oxygen species, molecules. And this is likely an issue for whales and dolphins because every time they dive, um, they get hypoxia, and when they come back to the surface to inhale, loads of oxygen cause an increase of these oxidative species and damage of macromolecular structures, including DNA. What they have lost is the most sloppiest of these DNA repair enzymes. And experiments in mouse have shown that if you knock out this particular enzyme, then yes, the fidelity of DNA repair is enhanced because then the more precise um, genes take over and do their job. But these mice have some um, defects, I think, in the immune system and in the um, hematopoiesis. So it tells us that um, those genes likely have an important role, um, but under a certain environmental condition, it is the, the benefits outweigh the, the downsides, and then you can lose a gene. What the downside is of uh, losing a gene, losing this gene in us and other mammals, we simply don't know. But it's a very good question. So if it's beneficial to lose a gene under certain um, um, condition or certain circumstances, then um, this is a relatively easy solution, right? Because um, evolution works with random mutations. And if you just have random typos, it's very easy to break something. It's much harder to create something new. And then we would argue that if independent species adapt to the same um, environment and evolve the same adaptation, then maybe evolution may come across the same solution at the molecular level multiple times. And this gene might get lost in a way um, several times or convergently. So to investigate this um, in a way, we um, adopted this forward genomics um, framework. And now we were not screening for increased nucleotide divergence of exons, but now in a way we switched to using our catalogs of, uh, of gene losses and um, try to find genes which are convergently lost in those species that have a certain um, phenotypic difference or adaptation. And the particular example I would like to mention is an adaptation to a um, carnivorous or herbivorous diet in mammals. So we try to search for genes systematically that are preferentially lost in independent herbivorous mammals. And one of the genes um, we found that likely belongs to this less is more category is called PNLIP RP1. And this gene is actually lost in eight independent um, herbivore lineages like horses, um, ruminants, the guinea pig, manatees, this is the naked mole rat and elephants, all strict herbivores. The function of this gene relates to the digestion of dietary fat, so triglycerides. If you get triglycerides in your diet, you need the um, enzyme triglyceride lipase to, to cleave them. And this enzyme requires um, another gene, a cofactor, to become active. What PNLIP RP1 is doing, it's, it is sequestering and binding this cofactor. And therefore, if you have this gene, you lower the effective amount of the cofactor and therefore inhibit this triglyceride lipase. And you can see this inhibitory effect if you knock out the gene in mice, where people can then measure that enzymatic activity is drastically increased, and these mice, um, in a way, double their fat content on a regular diet. So 
losing um, P and lip RP1 improves the efficiency of digesting dietary triglycerides. And we think this is certainly an advantage for these species. After all, plant-based material is very, um, typically very low in, uh, in, in triglyceride content, right? So we think this is a convergent case of less is more. So to sum up the, the second part, um, I showed you that we developed a um, highly accurate um, method to detect gene losses across um, genomes of many species. And we think that most of the gene losses we find belong to this use it or lose it category, where simply genes get lost because there's no selection pressure anymore to, to preserve them. Nevertheless, um, such cases can provide novel insights into species biology or evolutionary history. After all, it was not known that the sperm whale um, is most likely unable to synthesize vitamin A. And we think that sometimes it can be beneficial to lose a gene, and then gene losses can contribute to adaptive evolution. And we found um, many additional examples in the, um, the evolution of whales, um, or convergent cases of convergent gene losses shared between whales and dolphins and the manatee as a second fully aquatic lineage. We also found um, gene losses that likely um, help these fruit bats here to adapt to their very sugar-rich diet. Um, so this, we found in a way several examples that um, where gene losses likely contribute to morphological adaptations, physiological, and also metabolic adaptations. Okay, those are the people that uh, um, you know, work in the lab and uh, did pretty much the work. I highlighted here all those um, whose projects I, I talked about. I would also like to thank um, many collaborators in our institute and, uh, and elsewhere, the community for sequencing the vast majority of the, species, of the genomes that we've been analyzing, different sources of funding, and the last few minutes I'd like to give in, um, in a way an outlook. So I think that we're now in a position to address this question of what is the genomic basis of um, interesting phenotypic differences on a more systematic level. Um, and with this, of course, we hope to also learn fundamental principles of how evolution works and how evolution produced this fantastic phenotypic diversity. So to do this, we will make use of uh, numerous genomes that um, will be sequenced, that are in, in the process of being sequenced and will be sequenced in the near future. There are projects to sequence all bats, um, something we're involved in. Um, projects to sequence 10,000 vertebrates um, or 10,000 plants and then new initiatives to pretty much sequence everything we can literally catch. Um, so there will be a flood of genomes coming. And I I bet in the next decades, um, we will have sequenced a substantial portion of eukaryotic life. But to make sense out of this um, wealth of genomic data, we need um, computational methods. Methods that detect important types of genomic changes, such as those that um, I talked about. There are many other types of changes where I think methods need to be developed to specifically capture them. Um, there's definitely room for improvement to systematically associate phenotypic differences to genomic differences. Um, and thinking of not only 60 or 120 genomes, but thousands of genomes, we need methods that scale to this amount of data. And by definition, they have to be highly accurate because um, error in a way would simply multiply with the number of genomes you look at, and at some point your signal is watered down so much that you wouldn't detect it anymore, or you detect noise. And then, thanks to advances in, uh, in molecular technologies, um, we can begin to um, explore such um, links between genotype and phenotype, for example, by using functional genomics to measure um, if a gene really has a different um, expression level, or using this ataxic method to um, obtain genome-wide, um, in a way, view of the, the regulatory landscape. And of course, with CRISPR-Cas9, it gets easier and easier to then to recapitulate the evolutionary changes in suitable systems, like manipulating cells in a dish 
um, of manipulating the gene of interest in model organisms. And with that, I think that combining computational methods development, comparative and functional genomics, we will be able to um, at least learn some important aspects of uh, how many interesting traits evolved. Um, probably a particular focus should be on traits um, that have some sort of human relevance. So we can learn something from nature. For example, um, these species live on a sugar-rich diet, um, yet they don't get diabetes, or bats um, are very long-lived for their body size. There are some bats which weigh less than 10 gram, yet they get 40 or more years old. Um, and they show very few signs of senescence. Um, they have very low rates of cancer. And there are bad lineages with live, that live with deadly viruses like Ebola or SARS, yet they don't um, suffer from any of the symptoms or actually die. Right? So there are many interesting traits um, we can learn something from. And in the long term, of course, um, we hope that we will be able to extract um, fundamental principles and develop a, um, a general understanding of how these endless forms um, evolved at the molecular level. Thank you very much.